Hi, hello, I'm Sam Harris and I read, review and discuss fantasy and science fiction books. Today we have a review on The Shadow Rising, the fourth book in The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. This is going to be a non-spoiler review. I'll be filming a full spoiler discussion with my friend Matt over at Bask in the Story, which will be hosted on his channel uh, later this month. Um, we, uh, I finished this literally on the last day of the month. Uh, we're reading one, one book a month together. But I've had the world's busiest, most insane month. And then uh, I only managed to finish it today, which is... Uh, I'm recording this the day before it goes up. So I finished this on the very last day of April. Um, and Matt has started the book, um, but is obviously, he's not finished, so he's not ready to discuss. So, um, yeah, don't know when our full spoiler discussion will be. However, um, let's go straight into my non-spoiler review on this book, The Shadow Rising, which is... Uh, I'm going to say it, the best book so far in The Wheel of Time. It's also the longest book in The Wheel of Time. Um, one thing I also want to say up front is thank you very much to my friend Mare for sending me her copy that she no longer wanted. Uh, this copy matches my collection of editions. I like these kind of photo, kind of grey photo covers. Uh, so this matches my editions and I read uh, actually almost... I must have read probably most of this physically. So with the previous books, I've kind of... So what I do with these books, I buy the physical book, I buy the ebook, I buy the audio book. And then I tend to read like 30% audio, 20% ebook, and then the rest of it by uh, the physical copy. But this one, um, I read almost all through this physical copy. Um, just really enjoying the physical reading this month. Uh, might have been why my reading was a bit slower, but I was just really enjoying it. Um, so let's talk about this book. So in the previous book, um, Brand, Brand? Rand uh, draws uh, Kalendor, for, which is kind of a sword made of crystal, um, which is a sword that cannot be held basically um he uh, by kind of magics and all that sort of stuff he draws it in uh the stone of tear which is very much a kind of king arthur excalibur moment um and that kind of cements him in the public consciousness as being the dragon reborn uh when we come back to rand in the shadow rising rand has not only been kind of cemented as the dragon reborn but he's also been cemented as basically the de facto ruler of Tyr. So he is ruling Tyr um, and his friends and companions from previous books are all kind of thrust into the limelight as well. Um, so Perrin is kind of being treated like a lord and he doesn't want to be. And, and Matt is being treated like a lord and uh, he is very much using that to go gambling with people who have way more money than uh, previous. We also see that um, the characters are kind of vulnerable now. So now that Rand has kind of declared himself the Dragon Reborn, um, he's now a little bit more vulnerable to attacks from Dark Friends, um, which means that he may not want to stay in one place very long. Um, he discovers that by staying in one place too long um, at the tier, at the Stone of Tear. Um, we also get to catch up with basically every character in the main cast. Um, so we get POV chapters from uh, people like Elaine, Nynaeve, Egwene, Moraine, um, and Min. Lots of Min POVs, which are fun. Um, there's some. I would say one of the min POV chapters, it was a huge surprise to me personally. Like, um, not much in these books has been like, oh, I really didn't expect that. But there was definitely, even though Jordan had aggressively hinted at it, one of the min chapters, like, massively surprised me. Um, and it takes a lot for books to surprise me, I have to say. So um, I said earlier that this is my favourite 
well not my favorite this is this is my favorite although i've got i've got a real soft spot for the dragon reborn because of the way that the narrative is woven around rand without rand in it um, rand is also um not the majority pov here so rand is the pov for like uh, according to the stats i think it's like 20 percent um and perrin actually has 30 percent of the book so perrin has the most page time screen time and this book really does feel like perrin's book and um previously i had been kind of indifferent to perrin so we'd kind of had if we look at the emmons field characters we'd have had rand as kind of my original favorite because he's you know he's the protagonist he's kind of intended to be the favorite and i think that his chapters were really well written in um either world i mean he's all the chapters in either world but i especially really enjoyed the chapters of him and his dad trying to escape the trollocs at the beginning um and uh rand and matt going up the road to camelin um there's a lot of really good rand stuff in book one um and then in book two it kind of cemented rand as being a bit more rounded and a bit more interesting as a character and we got to see some uh other povs from people like Egwene, nynaeve and perrin uh but throughout those first two books i was pretty indifferent to perrin because i feel like um perrin was mostly being used to deliver the joke of like oh, I wish I knew how to talk to girls like Rand did. And then Rand basically thinking, I wish I knew how to talk to girls like Perrin does. Um, uh, and also he was kind of giving us this insight into the wolf stuff um, and kind of starting us down on the dream storyline, which kind of becomes much, much, much more important in the Dragon Reborn. Um, when we get to the Dragon Reborn, so, I mean, across the first two books... It was kind of like, I like Rand, I'm indifferent to Perrin, and I don't like Matt. But a lot of that is because of the kind of the curse that Matt is carrying in the first two books. And in The Dragon Reborn, Matt essentially shot from being least favourite major character to most. Um, I would say from The Dragon Reborn, he was my most favourite character in that book. Um, and it felt like Perrin kind of took a back seat um and karen's karen perrin's conflict um becomes mostly between kind of uh, his aggressive nature as a wolf brother and his kind of desire for peace and to you know not have to kill anymore not have to take lives um and there's a big that theme kind of continues on into the shadow rising and i think one of the big things with this book is um you really get that view of perrin's psyche and of how he thinks and and, and this conflict inside him um, and a lot of that is um made very clear in his re relationship with fail um his relationship with fail also um, is the most evolved and mature romantic relationship in the show uh show book um i don't know about the show i think they i feel like i read that they had cast a file but like anyway it doesn't really matter so um it become their relationship is very very much central to um parent's story and um this is an extremely minor spoiler um uh, but perrin spends basically the entire book away from the rest of the characters so with him and fail and a couple of others and he spends his time um in a location that we have seen before um trying not to spoil it because i did really enjoy it uh the kind of reveal and um, the whole of the story he basically spends the majority of his time somewhere we've been before uh, defending it against a trollic invasion and so we have this kind of pincer where we've got perrin and the people that he cares about in the middle of like trollocs on one side white coats on the other everyone wants to kill everyone so uh ex and the villagers just kind of want to uh be left alone and live their lives 
Um, I really enjoyed getting to revisit somewhere with the characters now in their kind of known Tavaran, Tavaran, whatever. Uh, now the characters are kind of known and uh, famous in some cases. A lot of the time, uh, Perrin will, will, will kind of come to come somewhere and the characters will be like, oh, it's Perrin Golden Eyes. So, you know, there's that like uh, newfound fame aspect almost. Uh, we don't see enough in this book of some of my favourite side characters. So I think ever since book one, I've been saying there was not enough Lan in this book. Um, even though this this is the longest Wheel of Time book. So across all 15 books or whatever it is, I, I say 13, 14, 15 every single time. And every single time I'm wrong. So however many books there are, this is the longest one. Um, I know that some of the Sanderson ones are close, but this is the longest. Um, and we have no LAN POVs still. And LAN is only um, kind of a background character almost in uh, Rand's stories, uh, Rand's chapters. Um, and again, Rand is only 20% of the book. We're introduced to a lot of new and interesting characters here, like um, Egianin, Egianin. I don't really know how it's pronounced. I didn't listen to that on the audiobook. Um, speaking of the audiobook, super tangent, but Michael Kramer pronounces loads of things differently to Rosamund Pike. And that was very frustrating because I really enjoyed the Rosamund Pike narration. Michael Kramer and Kate Reddings is just not as good. I think it, it's fine, but I have no idea why people got so attached to them. Um, I like the kind of combo, the duo of the, the male and female narrator as well. Um, and I did, I like Kate Redding a lot. I thought she was great. Um, but Michael Kramer was kept calling Moraine Moraine, like kind of, he was adding a W in there, like Moira almost. Um, and that's not how anyone else pronounces it. Um, like not in the show. And I think Kate Redding actually does pronounce it quite similarly, like Moraine. Um, but Moraine is so much more, I don't know. That's a very, very small side tangent that I'm saying, unfortunately, I don't really like the Kramer and Redding narration. However, the thing that I did really like was this book. So, um, yeah, we've got, you know, we get to do the classic Wheel of Time thing, which is where all the characters split off on individual missions. Um, interestingly, one of the things that I like is that um, several of the characters that go with Rand on his journey kind of have their own um, motivations and their own goals, um, which are separate to his. So previously you kind of get like, right, these characters are going to go this place and do this thing. Um, but now we're getting like, well, this character is doing this thing, this character is doing this thing, and this character is doing this thing, but they're all going to the same place, um, which I really enjoyed. Um, we don't get anywhere near enough Matt in this book. So this book is extremely Perrin heavy, like I said, um, which is great because I now really like Perrin as a character. Uh, but I was missing Matt a little bit. Um, his chapters are always really funny. Um, and while there were a few jokes that I laughed at in this book, uh, there was a great one. Um, Rand makes a fantastic, like, off-the-cuff comment about relations between men and women, which I genuinely laughed out loud at. Um, File makes a lot of uh, it makes a lot of kind of funny jokes. Um, yeah, it, it's a funny one as well. It's not as funny as Dragon Reborn because most of the humor comes from Matt's chapters, and Matt's not in this book that much. He's in the background a lot. Um, there's a fantastic scene where like a lot of things are coming to a head, um, and <laughs> like this big kind of there's like a big conflict that's kind of imminent and matt uh ran keeps referencing that matt is kind of in the background going like should we get out of here like and that was making me laugh every time the fact that it happens once was funny and then that it kept happening was very funny um we also around the middle of the book i would say we learn a lot about the aiel um we get some backstory stuff for them which while not massively surprising, um, was still very interesting. And 
I it kind of led me to think uh, quite a lot um, about the kind of his, history and, and how it affects and you know knowing the history of, of your people and knowing what it's actually like versus what you've been told it's like um, growing up in England you hear a lot about how amazing and great and fantastic the British Empire was um, but then as we you know as as historians start to look at um what the british empire did with a little bit of a, a more unbiased lens you see that um we were not the best thing in the world ever for other countries um and maybe the fact that basically everywhere that we had as an empire has seceded um should probably tell us something about having an empire um, and that maybe empires aren't great but that kind of taking that point of like re-examining history and stuff that comes in a lot in this book um especially around like the Aiel um and is actually kind of a pivotal moment later on in the book um the yeah so the history stuff with the Aiel was really really fascinating and uh, we got to see a little bit of the like um the previous turn of the wheel almost so um they talk about how you know the the wheel turns and and things change um uh, but then you think about lewis lose therin uh and you think about how when we saw his chapter he's still very much like a medieval europe style setting but then some of the stuff that's described or hinted at in the Shadow Reborn, Shadow Reborn, Shadow Rising almost has a bit of a sci-fi flavour to it. Um, you can see why Brandon Sanderson loved The Wheel of Time and was very inspired by it. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on in this book. Um, and there should be because it is the longest Wheel of Time book. And I feel like more happens in this book than happens in most of the previous books. I mean, we have... Um, kind of like three or four discrete locations that characters kind of end up in and each uh, each location almost has its own like big end battle conf confrontation um, speaking of endings I do think that this is the first time Jordan really nailed an ending so each time uh, the book has ended I felt like with either world the ending was very rushed and i found it hard to understand and then in the great hunt again i i felt like i was struggling to pick out the actual actions of what was happening um but it was more interesting to it was better to read um and i felt that the ending was kind of a better culmination but it still kind of was like and here are these other people and they also hate round um and th so that was kind of not as good of an ending, um, but improving. Then the Dragon Reborn, I thought, had quite a good ending um, and a lot of good build-up to it. But I feel like it kind of just ended um, in a way that could have been more satisfying, but was still a good ending for the book. Whereas this one, basically every plot line has its own ending. Um, so, you know, Perrin's story has a, a big dynamic um and an interesting end then we get the same for um elaine and nynaeve's storyline uh, and we then get the final uh with with rand um kind of tying up the book um we also learn a lot about ideal culture we get to see where they live and, and how they live and we get to learn a lot more about the ideal um through rand we get to experience more of um another culture the tarabon culture through um elaine and nynaeve's story um we get to see a little bit more interaction between characters that haven't really interacted as much before so uh tom Marilyn spends a lot of time with uh the girls in this one with nynaeve and elaine um and um loyal and perrin get a bit of screen get quite a bit of screen time with each other um and um Egwene actually gets to spend time with Rand 
for the first time since like the beginning of book one. Um, so yeah, I think that changing up which characters are with who, and then also on top of that, um, giving us, as Jordan is wont to do with these books, a view into another culture and another location. Um, and in fact, we kind of get multiple this time because we get, uh, we spend a lot of time in Tyr, we spend time in the Aiel Waste, we spend time in Tarabon, in Tanchico, um, and we get kind of a look at all of these new cultures. Um, and we get to spend more time in a place we visited before, which is really good. Um, we get to learn a lot about our characters, new and uh, old. Uh, and we get introduced to um, and some, and some kind of a deepening of previous cultures and characters that we discussed. Um, yeah, it's I could talk about this book all day. And um, unfortunately, it's kind of hard, I would say, to discuss this book without spoilers, um, because even talking about like the place that Perrin goes to might be considered a spoiler to some people. Um, and like, I really don't want to ruin that for you um, if you're that kind of reader. And I have to say, I'm that kind of reader. Like, I'm, I would not want to know what happened in this book. And one of the things that's quite funny is like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, the blurb on the back of the books would have had X, Y, Z. But the blurb on the back of this book is the most vague of all time. It's basically a little bit of talking about what the wheel is. Wheel of time turns and ages come and pass, blah, blah, blah. And then the next line is what was, what will be, and what is may yet fall to the shadow. And like, that tells you nothing about this book. But it's because honestly you've got to be pretty bought in if you're reading this um four books in a thousand page book um yeah so it is a thousand pages long it did not feel that massively long and it definitely didn't feel arduous in any way the one uh caveat i'll give you guys to that one is that i did read this over over two weeks um so normally each Wheel of Time book, I've been basically reading a day quicker than the one before it. So, Eye of the World took me like a week, and then Great Hunt took me like six days, and then The Dragon Reborn was like five days. Um, but this one took 16 days, um, only though because I have had much, much, much less reading time in April. Um, I would imagine that in May, The Fires of Heaven will still get read a lot quicker. Um, but yeah fantastic book if you're already uh reading the wheel of time and you haven't got to this one yet this is one you should check out um and i would move it up your tbr honestly if you're if you you know you've been sat on the dragon reborn for a few months or if you're reading this series very very slowly i think you genuinely deserve uh, and you owe it to yourself to move the shadow rising up your tbr um, the Shadow Rising, um, I have already recorded my April recap, but The Shadow Rising is my favourite book I read in April. Admittedly, I only read two and a half books in April, but this was my favourite. Um, it is currently my favourite Wheel of Time book, um, mostly because I think that, again, this is the first one where Jordan really nails the ending, and he also deviates a little bit from his previous formula, which is kind of like, all the characters separate out and then they all come back together so like the previous books are kind of diamondy where like a lot of possibilities happen in the middle and then the possibilities close in on themselves and they all kind of come back together whereas this book is really a triangle the characters separate out together and then they don't get back together um i'm really curious to see what happens next especially um there's a load of stuff going on in tarvalon as this book ends um and several of the characters have said well it's time to go back to tarvalon and i'm like i'm really curious to see what's going to happen here um so really looking forward to reading the fires of heaven luckily i only have one book in between this and the fires of heaven because uh this has taken me so long and i usually read my will of time because it's the first fantasy book of the month so i only have one sunny to book and then it's straight into fires of heaven so if you have read The Shadow Rising, drop a comment down below and tell me what you thought. Um, tell me your favourite characters, your favourite storylines, 
Everyone who is watching this video, please be aware that there might be some light spoilers down in the comments if you have not read the book. Try and keep it vague, everyone. I don't want to have to be like, oh, can you delete that, blah, blah, blah. That's not fun. Um, let's keep it light, breezy and vague so that people who might be seeing this video who haven't read the book are able to drop down in the comments and let us know maybe whether they're really excited to read this book and whether they're moving, if you're moving this up your TBR, let me know because um, I would love to hear your comments once you've finished reading it. So let me know you move up to the TBR and then come back and reply to your comment and tell me what you thought. If you've liked this video, give it a like and please do subscribe to the channel. We're actually kind of closing in on 600 subscribers, which is mad things. We only hit 500 in uh, early April. So if you are not subscribed yet, Please do subscribe for lots more Wheel of Time content to come. There is going to be also another video that I'm making with Matt, which is going to be like um, a kind of wrap up of the first three books, what we thought of the first trilogy in the Wheel of Time. Um, so just to kind of have a bit of extra content out there. Um, but please do subscribe for more Wheel of Time and... Uh, for everything else that I talk about on this channel, which is fantasy and science fiction books, and I will speak to you tomorrow.